Hi, I'm Matthew Lester from the Rhodes Business School. I've embarked on a little project to see if we could use modern technology to present a tutorial to tax students. I'm looking at the UNISA DIP Act 38 examination written on in October 2011 and I'm hoping that by presenting this I can help students prepare for their forthcoming examinations. Right, you look at the paper. When you open it up you have a heart attack because you see 50 marks 75 minutes. Long question. The big thing that you've got to do is before you even start reading the paper go to the end of the paper and look at the required portion because that actually breaks it up into three parts. Part one is requiring you to do a capital gains tax calculation in respect of a donation of a holiday home. That's 10 marks, a simple little question. Then we go and we say what's in part two? Part two is 12 marks looking at the unexpended portion of a travel allowance. We've all done that before. You don't have to have a heart attack in that this forms part of a longer question. So what we see is that 22 marks of the 50 marks are really allocated to shorter questions. And then we get another important fact to pick up there is that we are looking at employment of the taxpayer for only half the year. We must remember that as there are marks allocated to it. Part 3 is what we all get worried about. That's a longer tax comp and we're looking at a whole tax year which consists of employment income and then business income and that's 28 marks or 42 minutes. Po importantly, the longer portion of the question is only 60% of the total mark. Right, now you get out a highlighter before you start writing anything and you pick up what is relevant and what is not. The age of the taxpayer is only relevant in the medical aid computation because nobody is talking about calculating actual tax, compu actual tax liability the age of the taxpayer is not of particular relevance as we are not calculating rebates. We will only be using that in the section 6A medical aid deduction. The fact that the taxpayer left employment on 30 September is only relevant in that we are looking at apportionment of travel allowances across half a year. The taxpayer is married out of community of property so there is no problem here in splitting interest income and then the taxpayer has one child, again we don't need to take that into account for rebate purposes, but we do still have him on the medical aid. We see that a second business was started in November 2012 and commenced for four months in the tax year. Also important, we don't have to consider VAT or the turnover tax system. We are purely looking at a sole trader and lumping it on top of it, his employment income. Carry on reading. Then come up all the figures. You've simply got to highlight here. I need the basic cash salary. That's very easy. There's the total amount of the travel allowance. That's in part two. The loan from the employer will give rise to a fringe benefit, which I'm going to have to calculate. We all know that donation receipts are tax-free, but we need to mention that. We know that foreign dividends are fully taxable, but a portion of it is exempt. There's a calculation required there. There is interest received from a South African bank, and we mustn't forget to deduct the exempt portion. Then there is the business income, which might require adjustment. What frightens us all is the medical aid fund dealings and we're going to have to do quite a complicated calculation on that one. Then there is a purchase of a delivery vehicle which we have to look at notes on, a donation made by the taxpayer which has a CGT implication, that's part one of the question, then there's maintenance of a house in Johannesburg that it has a deduction implication against trade income and then finally there is a retirement annuity fund computation so we've got an NRFI computation. Carrying on, reading in the notes, you've received a travel allowance per month and then we have the details of the cash amount of the vehicle which would be used if we were going per table and then we also have the actual expenses. So we know from that that we are going to need to do a comparison between a deduction based on actual expenses and 
a deduction based on the travel allowance tables. Following on from that are the figures that you are going to need to do an actual tax computation. Then we get the details of the logbook and private and business mileage. We're going to need that in the computations of the travel allowance deduction and we need to notice that we are only computing for 214 days. The employer has given an interest-free loan. There they give the rate charged and the official rate. We should know by now that that gives rise to a fringe benefit. Then we get some other information about the holiday host home. We see that it is an inheritance that obviously establishes the base cost and that there was no repayment of the loan from the employer. This means that the, that triggers another fringe benefit of both the capital and interest waived. We see the details of the medical aid fund, how much was paid by the employer and how much was paid by the employee. We also see a continuing fringe benefit after resignation, but we know by now that that is a fringe benefit. We get details of a second-hand delivery vehicle. We mustn't run up the wrong track here because VAT is irrelevant. We have told that the taxpayer is not registered for VAT. What we do see, however, is that the vehicle was acquired at below market value, so we have a further fringe benefit that needs to be taxed. We see the question of an inherited holiday home. Obviously, that is given for purposes of establishing the base cost. The improvement to the pool would obviously be a capital improvement, but we know that the value of curtains, etc., is domestic expenditure that does not get added to base cost. Where we see the donation of a house to a child who is 21 years old, we know that that triggers off both a donations tax and a CGT event and consequently we know that we have got to look down further down the question and find the donations tax expenditure. Part of that has got to be added to base cost for purposes of taxing the capital gain. Then we get the question of a rented home and expenditure which is easily recognized as being capital expenditure for office equipment that needs to be written off over a six-year period but providing that it is only used for four months during the tax year. And then we get the question of that the study covered 20% of the total floor area of the house. That is for purposes of apportionment of the expenditure. We also know that this expenditure cannot be deducted against employment income, only against the business income in the last four months of the year. There are the details of the expenses that we are obviously going to have to bring into the computations. Carrying on the final notes, we've got a retirement annuity fund contribution. That tells us that we are going to have to do an NRFI calculation. We have also got a Section 18A donation where the certificate has been received. So we have a question of limiting the deduction. And then finally, we have received a donation, which we know is a tax-free receipt. Now we go back to required. Part 1, for 10 marks and over 15 minutes, what we have to do is calculate the capital gain resulting from the donation of a holiday home. Right. What we do here is we start off and we say, find the market value of the donation. That's the 900,000 Rand. Then establish base cost, that's the value of the inheritance received per the question, and the improvements consisting of the, of the splash pool. We know that the curtains do not get added to base cost. So that's established base cost and proceeds. We then go into the formula that is applied to prorate the donations tax. So what do we do? We take the proceeds, 900,000, less the base cost, which is 600,000 on the inheritance and 25,000 Rand on the splash pool. We divide that by 900,000 Rand and multiply it by the 160,000 Rand's donations tax to give you the portion of the donations tax that is then added to base cost. That will then give you your capital gain and please don't forget to 
deduct off that the annual exemption of 30,000 Rand. That would be a complete waste of a mark. That gives you a capital gain, which you have then answered part one to the question, and you can carry that capital gain then into the final taxation computation. In part two, we have to do a travel allowance computation. We've been doing these for some time now. Notice you've got a generous mark allocation and a full 18 minutes to complete the question. We set it up as follows. Firstly, determine the allowance. 3,500 Rand times seven months for one mark. That's money for jam. Also, from the question, we can get the business mileage and the total mileage. Right. We use the cash cost of the vehicle, 385,000 Rand, to then look up the fixed cost component, which per tables is 105,809. You div then divide that by the total kilometers and multiply it by 214 days over 365. That would give you then the fixed cost per kilometer. Per tables, we then add in fuel and maintenance total it up and we've got a deemed cost per kilometer of 4,061 rands per kilometer. We then do the same calculation based on actual expenses. Finance charges we know are fully deductible. Wear and tear has to be worked out on the basis of seven years and that the vehicle was used for seven months out of 12. Then add in the other expenses and we get to total expenses per the year and we divide that by 28,000 kilometers to get a rate of 2 rand 45 per k. Obviously that is lower than the deduction that would be granted according to the cost per kilometer calculation based on deemed expenditure and thus we elect to use deemed expenditure 8,200 kilometers at 4 rand comma 061 per kilometer. That is a very easy 12 marks that we should have scored quite well on. Look at what we've achieved. We've now done 22 marks out of the possible 50, and really it was money for jam. The important issue at this stage is to realize that even when you get a long question, take the easy marks. You're already at 40% in this question if you've kept your head. Now we go to part three. That's the longer part that freaks everybody out. But let's go about it methodically and pick up the easy marks first. Right, take in the basic salary. Dead easy. We know a donation received is exempt from capital gains tax. So that's another mark scored. Foreign dividends are taxable, but you deduct 25 fortieths of the amount. Again, that's an easy mark. We then simply have to write down the interest and claim the annual interest exemption for another two marks. We identified in the reading of the paper that there is a low interest loan, so we go 25,000 times 8% less 3%, 8% being the official rate of interest, less the 3% actually incurred, times 7 months out of 12, that's another two marks in the bag. The release from the debt is a fringe benefit, but please remember that the question said they also let him off the interest component that he did not pay. So that's a further 438 Rand, but there's another two marks that you should acquire quite easily. We also recognized in correctly reading the paper that he was allowed to acquire the vehicle worth 105,000 for 70,175. That's a further fringe benefit in terms of the seventh schedule. Then we get to the medical aid contributions. So we say contributions made by the employer, 60%. Thank you very much. That's a fringe benefit. And then we also have to see the me medical aid contributions that continued after resignation that is still an amount received by virtue of employment and is still taxable. Finally, for an easy giveaway mark, we add in income from tree felling. So at this stage, what do we see? We've gone through a very easy process of the early part of the question, and we've scored some more marks. In fact, that was 14 marks out of a possible 30, and total now we have dealt with 36 marks out of a 50 mark question before we get to the difficult stuff that really freaks students out. 
and it's important that you could have actually passed this question before even getting to the end bit. But even at the end, we've got to keep our head. So now we go to the end and we say, right, we are trading for four months of the year, therefore the cost of maintaining a study at home can be deducted for four months. Four months at 20% of the total expenditure gives you a deduction of 14,000. And what we can do add to that is wear and tear, another simple calculation over six years, but prorated for the four months in use, a further 667 Rand. That's three marks quite easily scored. The part where people, students start to get really worried is in the NRFI calculation for purposes of calculating the deductible portion of the retirement annuity. Just get down the formula first. 1750 minimum or 3500 less pension fund contributions or 15% of NRFI limited to the actual contributions made. Now, you might not get that right, but you can easily score two of the three marks that are available. Then we have to add in the figures brought forward from parts one and two, the unexpended portion of the travel allowance, you've already done that, and the capital gain as well, we've already done that, but we got two marks from simply bringing them forward into the calculation. And then finally, we have to work out what portion of the donation is deductible, limited to actual, but remember that 10% of taxable income can be deducted um, if you have spent that much and you are in possession of an 18A certificate. The last barrier is the medical aid deduction, section 18. So first of all, we have to quantify what was spent. So we get medical aid contributions made by the taxpayer and made by the employer. Add them all up, there is the total expense. Then we have to deduct from that the 6A tax credit. Remember, what we've got there is 460 Rand per month, that's two dependents times 230, plus the son at university 154 per month, for 12 months times 4 equals pre-tax equivalent 29,472. We take that away from the 43,200 and we are left with 13,728. Expenses not covered by medical aid were 28,500 Rand, giving you total medical expenditure of 42,228. We then have to limit that by 7,5% of taxable income before this deduction. That's 39,185, giving you 3,043 deductible. Add it all up and we get to a total mark of 30 marks limited to 28. What have we learned from this exercise? Well, here are some concluding remarks. This is a 50 mark question that looks intimidating from the start. It can be a third of a paper, but when you read the questions and mark them up properly, divide it all up, you make sure that you can get to all the issues and then you can score marks. There is nothing worse than missing out on the easy marks. This question is li littered with easy marks that can easily be picked up that are worth over 50%. Divide up your questions and answers. Where people get freaked out is where they try and answer the whole question when they have not even read the paper. Plan your formatted and how you are going to answer the questions and keep to a basic grid. And finally, stick to time. The total, there's 75 minutes allocated to this question. At this standard, one would hope that one would score 5 or 10 minutes extra that you might need in a harder part of the paper. So, what do you think of this form of intervention? Does it help? Is it worth doing? Please let me know. This is Matthew Lester at the Rhodes Business School.